look is going on? Okay, let's keep going, shall we? Uh, a pro-democracy NGO, also not a left source, <laughs> reports that active reported at the time that activists are frequently harassed by vigilantes when holding legal meetings or rallies related to politically controversial positions, such as the promotion of LGBT rights or opposition to the war. Azov and other militias have attacked anti-fascist demonstrations, city council meetings, media outlets, art exhibitions, foreign students, and Roma, Roma population, or otherwise known pejoratively as gypsies. I'm just using that for people who don't know who the Roma is, but don't ever use that word. It's disgusting. Progressive activists describe a new climate of fear that they say has been intensifying ever since last year's near-fatal stabbing of anti-war activist Stas Sergeyenko, which is believed to have been perpetrated by an extremist group named C-14. The name refers to a 14-word slogan popular among white supremacists. Same 14-word slogan popular among white supremacists in this bitch right here. Brutal attacks this month on International Women's Day. Yep, they even hate women. Marches in several Ukrainian cities pr uh, prompted an unusually forceful statement from Amnesty International, also not a left source, which warned that the Ukrainian state is rapidly losing its monopoly on violence. The, even U Amnesty International was saying the Ukrainian state is incredibly violent toward the ethnic regions in its own country, oh but they have legitimized these right-wing fascist groups in their country to the point that they don't have a monopoly on violence anymore. Imagine that. Cohen goes on to say that Ukrainian extremists are rarely punished for acts of violence in some cases, such as C-14's January attack on, remembrance, on a remembrance gathering for two murdered journalists. Yes, they also murder journalists. Police actually detain peaceful demonstrators instead. To be clear, the Kremlin's claims that Ukraine is a hornet's nest of fascists are false. This is the bullshit in the article. This is the imperialist bullshit. Because you can't say that all of what they just he just highlighted is true. And that there is not just a small problem of right-wing fascist violence in the country, but that is big, it is growing, it is emboldened and legitimized by the Ukrainian state, and then turn around and say, oh, Ukraine is not a hornet's net of, nest of fascists. He has to include this imperialist bullshit because, you know, he doesn't want to seem like he's being an apologist for Putin. Um, <laughs> and, and this is the claim we have heard from the left, right? That, that far right parties didn't even win a whole lot of seats in the Ukrainian parliamentary, uh, parliamentary election. And Ukrainians were shocked about the national mal malicious demonstration, the little torch thing in Kiev. But then he turns right around and says, but connections between law enforcement agencies and extremists give Ukraine's Western allies ample reason for concern. <laughs> so Ukrainian law enforcement are working with the extremists because, you know, the extremists are a part of Ukrainian law enforcement and Ukrainian law enforcement is supported by the government. They are the enforcement arm of the Ukrainian government. And even this guy in trying to dismiss the problem and the influence of the violent right wing in Ukraine admits that Ukraine's Western allies, namely the United States, the EU, and NATO have ample reason for concern. Get the fuck out of, how are you going to sit there and tell me Howie Hawkins and the rest of y'all endorsing this bullshit Ukraine Solidarity Network that these are not issues we should raise, be concerned with, and be the foundation for our refusal to collude with the imperialists ever in any way, but particularly on this issue. Mm. He goes on to say C-14 and Kiev's city government recently signed an agreement allowing C-14 to establish a municipal guard to patrol the, street, the streets 
Three such militia-run guard forces are already registered in Kiev and at least operate in 21 other, or at least 21 operate in other cities. And that was in 2018. As one Ukrainian analyst noted in December, control of these forces make uh, Avakov, and this person was the opponent to the then president, the coup president, the president that the United States propped up in that audio recording of the phone call that Victoria Nuland made choosing the next president of Ukraine after uh, uh, Yanukovych was run out of Ukraine. It was Poroshenko that the U.S. chose. And Victoria Nuland said in that cold phone call, fuck the EU. I don't care what they want. We want Poroshenko. And that's who's going to be the president. And Lo and behold, look who was the next president of Ukraine. But even he, with the backing of the United States, could not control the right wing in Ukraine, the right wing that the United States legitimized, funded, and armed in order to overthrow the Yanukovych government. Uh, Ukrainian analysts note, noted in December, control of these forces make Avakov uh, extremely powerful, and Poroshenko's presidency might not be strong enough to withstand the kind of direct confrontation with Avakov that an attempt to oust him or to strike at his power base could well produce. Poroshenko at that point in 2018 has endured frequent <sighs> verbal threats, including calls for revolution from ultra-nationalist groups, so he may believe that he needs Avakov to keep them in check. Uh, and let me scroll up just really quickly here. Oh, here we go. Whoops. I wanted to make sure I explained to you who Avakov is. <clears throat> because uh, Cohen points out that in an ideal world, President uh, Petro Poroshenko would purge the police and the interior military of far-right sympathizers, including interior minister Arsen Avakov. That's who he was at the time, who has close ties to Azov leader Andriy Beletsky as well as Sergei Koret's kids, I'm so butchering that name, but they're fascists, so I don't give a shit, an Azov veteran who is now a high-ranking police official. So, so what? That the right, far right parties didn't gain much in the elections. They were prominent in Ukrainian law enforcement. And they were powerful enough that even the U.S. selected president, Petro Poroshenko, felt that he could not purge them. He could not control them. So he didn't. He felt like he needed to keep them there to keep the right wing in check. So that's what's going on with Zelensky to a degree today. But remember, Zelensky won his election. He campaigned on returning to normalized, friendly relations with Russia. So he went into this knowing very well the, uh, the influence of the fascist right, of the fascists in Ukraine, understanding what happened with Poroshenko, and he went into it willingly. So there's only so much of him being a victim that I'm going to give him here. Cohen <clears throat> ends his piece saying there's no easy way to eradicate the virulent far right extremism that has been poisoning Ukrainian politics and public life. But without vigorous and immediate efforts to counteract it, it may soon endanger, it may soon endanger the state itself. And look at where we are. I don't know what else anybody else want me to say about this whole ridiculous mess. I'm, I'm very confused about um, the willingness of so many on the so-called left oh, man. to uh, not just repeat uh, the empire's talking points about this conflict in Ukraine, um, which, remember, could have been avoided if Ukraine had only abided by the Minsk Accord requirement to give Donbass and Luhansk the special status 
and autonomy that they literally voted for. That's it. That all that's all Ukraine had to do. These issues of uh, NATO encroachment and uh, uh, on on Russia's uh, territorial security. I think those conversations would have continued on. From what it seems like to me, from what Putin has said, from what Sergei Lavrov has have said, from what every Russian diplomat has said, from what even the G7 acknowledged, the, the major sticking point was the refusal of Ukraine to give Donbass and Luhansk the territorial uh, uh, independence and sovereignty that they voted for. That that would have avoided all of this. But here we here we are. And before I go, and thank you all for sticking with me for longer than an hour because I'm pissed off. Can you tell? Can you tell I'm pissed off? Because I'm sick of these latte leftists. Believing that because they have years in this movement, because they uh, uh, they have this track record of whatever it is they consider activism, because you know they have titles behind or before their names, and they have big platforms, and and whatever reason they have for telling actual anti-imperialists that we are morally wrong in not supporting Ukraine in their just war against Russian aggression, these people have lost their fucking minds. If they think they have any kind of moral standing to stand up on their flimsy motherfucking soapbox and tell actual African anti-imperialists that we are misguided about who the fuck our enemy is. We're clear on who our enemy is. Our enemy is and always has been U.S. imperialism. And in this case, where these mostly white but some black so-called leftists are happily siding with a fascist state, because quite literally because they hate Vladimir Putin, because in their minds, he is a boogeyman. He is the boogeyman then they're the enemy too. They absolutely are. And there really is no equivocation about that. So another reason this um, Ukraine Solidarity Network is just oh, repulsive. Oh, um, th these are the principles and goals uh, they say they hold to. Let me share my screen again so you don't think I'm making it up. <laughs> Whoops. There we go. This is it. And I only have this up for reference. I'm not endorsing this shit. That, that, fuck no. Oh, this is just so ridiculous. Um... Oh, where where is the where is the I want oh there it is okay I want to make sure I get to a certain part in this their demands their principles and goals they say we strive for a world free of global global power domination at the expense of smaller nations so never mind what the U S the E U and NATO has done throughout the entire existence of NATO. The very reason that NATO was formed was to do exactly what they claim they strive for a world free of. NATO was formed uh, to bully smaller nations into being subservient to U.S. Uh, European, what uh, John Mubaraka calls the pan-European project of imperialist hegemony. That's why NATO was formed. It's not a defensive agency. The rest of the world, nations in the world weren't threatening the U.S. and European nations. Ugh. They say we oppose war and authoritarian uh, and authoritarianism, no matter which state it comes from. 
So they, they don't oppose the war that was imposed upon the people in Donbass and Luhansk. They don't give a shit about that. <laughs> and support the right to, of self-determination and self-defense de for any oppressed nation. Again, they don't care about the right to self-determination of the people in Donetsk and Luhansk and Crimea. They, they didn't care about the self-determination of those people. They just sad about the white people in Ukraine who oh, they say we support Ukraine's victory against the Russian invasion and its right to reparations. This right here. These motherfuckers support the right of Ukraine, a fascist state in the past and today. Their right to reparations to meet the cost of reconstruction after the colossal destruction in its suffered. Get the entire fuck out of, I told you the cuss words were coming because I, I don't see any need to be diplomatic in talking about this bullshit, this clear allegiance to pan-European white, pan-European white grievance bullshit. That's what this is. These people who signed on to this network, this uh, Ukraine solidarity network, I don't recall them demanding reparations for the people in Libya to what the United States and NATO did to those Africans. Do you? Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm always open to being incorrect and always open to being corrected because a good revolutionary is not averse to comradely correction. So if I'm wrong about these people not calling for reparations for Libyans, please let me know. But you and I know damn well I'm not wrong because none of these people who have signed on to this Ukraine Solidarity Network, Howie Hawkins, none of these people ever call for reparations for Libya. Have they called for reparations for the U.S. drone bombings in Somalia? Have they called for reparations for Syria? Have they called for reparations for Palestinians? Shit, have they called for reparations or Africans in this part of the diaspora who are gunned down by, by the police for a year, as 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 I know I said Uri, for <laughs> a year, as Ajamu pointed out. No, but they are supportive of Ukraine's right to reparations. That is just pan-European white grievance allegiance. And I, I don't I don't know what else to call that. And it doesn't matter that there are black people who sign on to this ridiculousness, but I just really think that some of those folks could not possibly have read that and thought critically about, hmm, what have any of these people said about reparations for the Africans throughout this world and the indigenous people and the Afro-descended people in the global South and all around the world who have been victims of U.S. and Western imperialism? Have they said much about reparations for those people? <sighs> they go on to say that the reconstruction of Ukraine also demands the cancellation of his debts, uh, of its debts. Uh, to international financial institutions. Hold on. Thank you. I just, I, I'm not ignoring your comments. I'm just in my bag. I'm sorry. Um, You know, I got tunnel vision when I'm in my bag. You know, that's how I do. And I apologize. Uh, but I just saw this comment because I was going to go right there. Haiti deserves billions and trillions of reparations from the United States and France and all their friends today. Haiti's debts need to be canceled. African nation's debts to the IMF, every single one of them need to be canceled. Have we heard any of these people who have signed on to this Ukraine Solidarity Network and this particular demand, have they applied the same demand for the cancellation of a nation's debts 
to any other country that is indebted to the criminal international monetary fund and the World Bank? Fuck no. They have not. They say that <clears throat> aid to Ukraine must come without strings attached, above all, without crushing debt burdens. And, and it's wild because this kind of thing is the very thing that African people, African descended people and indigenous people are fighting against in countries where people are rising up against their neoliberal right wing governments that are backed by the United States right now to this day. They're fighting against austerity policies imposed by the IMF and their loan restructuring schemes. Zimbabwe, anybody? Zimbabwe? Then they go on to say, we recognize the suffering that this war imposes on people in Russia. They don't give a damn about people in Russia. Most intensely on ethnic and religious minority sectors of the Russian Federation, which are disproportionately disproportionately impacted by forced military conscription. And it's interesting that they would bring this up, but they don't bring up the fact that Ukraine barred men between the ages of, I think it was 16 and 60, from leaving the regions, their regions and cities in their countries so that they could be forced to serve in the Ukrainian army. But, but we're supposed to be having a conversation about balance, right? We're supposed to be having a balanced conversation, but these people ain't engaged in that kind of a conversation. We salute the brave Russian anti-war forces speaking out and demonstrating in the face of severe repression. And we are encouraged by the popular resistance to the draft of soldiers to become cannon fodder for Putin's war of aggression. Again, nothing about the Ukrainian conscription, conscription. nothing about that. Go on to say, we build, uh, we seek to build connections to progressive organizations and movements in Ukraine with and with the labor movement, which represents the biggest part of Ukrainian civil society, and to link Ukrainian civic organizations, marginalized communities, and trade unions with counterpart organizations of the United States. We support Ukrainian struggles for ensuring just and fair labor rights for its population, especially during the war, as there are no military reasons to impl implement laws that threaten the social rights of Ukrainians, including, including those who are fighting on the front line. So it's interesting that they sort of kind of allude to a little bit in a very light fashion, the fascist laws restricting the rights of the very people they want, they claim they want to support. Labor unions, workers movements, uh, marginalized communities and trade unions, uh, civic organizations in Ukraine, but they don't go into detail about the ways that the Ukrainian government has actually removed these people's rights, completely obl obliterated them. Ah, don't believe me? Okay. <clears throat> Where is it? Ukraine's anti-worker law, Law 5371, which strips back labor protections, was ratified in August 2022. Mm -hmm. This is at open democracy. You mean to tell me Howie Hawkins and his friends couldn't find that? Sure they could have. Uh, let's see, here. Oh, I'm sorry. No, not that one. There we go. No, not that one. Where'd the other one go? Oh, yeah, we talked about Ukraine banning political op opposition. Uh, I think there was, uh, where is it? I don't have that one, I don't think. Oh, here it is. Here's the other one. Ukraine revokes the citizenship of 13 Russian priests or 
they say they're Russian priests. Uh, Ukraine has voked uh, Volodymyr Zelensky, they are uh, a clear to name, has revoked the Ukrainian citizenship of 13 clerics of the Russian affiliated Ukrainian church. The priests who haven't fled may be expelled from Ukraine just for being priests and ethnic Russians. Uh, this was done on December 2nd. Since November, Ukraine has conducted nationwide raids on religious sites that belong to the Russian controlled church, which during which authorities say they have so far found Russian passports, if they're ethnic rough, of course they would have Russian anti-Ukrainian propaganda. Remember the civil war that the Ukrainian government waged against the people in the eastern regions of Ukraine. I guess they'd be mad about that shit. Uh, Anti-Ukrainian propaganda and they claim a stolen collection of icons. <sighs> okay, anyway. Searches have also taken place at the Moscow Patriot Patriarchate controlled uh, Kiev Perchersk Lavra. It's worth noting that uh, I believe it was Steve Bannon uh, and other U.S. right-wing uh, forces that helped create the Ukrainian Orthodox Church uh, in opposition to the Orthodox Church that existed in Ukraine before. You mean to tell me all of the information that I shared with y'all in this, woo, we've been going for an hour and 40 minutes, y'all. All this information that I, I was able to scare up sitting at my computer, at my desk, in my house. You mean to tell me Howie Hawkins with all his experience and being in left politics and all these people who have signed on to support this Ukraine Solidarity Network, all these people. Some of these people quite noteworthy in left anti-war activism. A lot, of, a lot of black folks. You mean to tell me they didn't have access to all of this information? Bullshit. Yes, they did. They did. And <clears throat> I'm not in these people's minds. I can't tell you why, definitively, why they have made the decision to take the position they have other than what it looks like to me. It looks very much to me like uh, these people, and I'm sorry, I'm just being petty now because I can, because, you know, this is my show. I'd be petty if I won't. <laughs> Some of these organizations that they represent, <sighs> these people have decided to pledge their allegiance to the pan-European hegemonic project that the U.S., the EU, and NATO are head of, that they direct. And even though some of the people and the organizations represented on this list are not European organizations, um, some are organizations that purport to represent the interests and people that report to represent the interests of African people in this part of the diaspora, I don't see how they can by signing on to this project. Because this project, I think, is a, a very important example of the lack of intellectual honesty, the lack of clear just dialectical materialism that's floating around on the left like a disease, like a virus. It's, it's more virulent than COVID, this, this, this intellectual uh, uh, laziness and this lack of dialectical materialism that people are just... So these folks, these latte left liberals um, have really expressed their allegiance to pan-Europeanism. 
And the black folks that have signed on to this mess have done so without the kind of intellectual uh, rigor that they needed to have applied to it, uh, that they should have applied to this conflict from the very beginning, um, but that they have refused to because I think for some of these people, they find some utility. They can see some uh, political positioning in their hopefully getting a piece of the pie of the pan-European project. I'm thinking that some of these people will feel like, well, maybe, maybe the empire will leave us alone to do whatever it is we want to do. But I can't believe wholly and entirely that they're that stupid to think that they can negotiate with the enemy in such a manner. Because nothing that they could want to do for the people, if they are being sincere in their work, would ever be sanctioned and allowed. There's nothing that is truly for the people that would affect the material conditions or improve the material conditions of the people and really undermine and weaken the hold that capitalism has on and over our people. And they're not going to be allowed to do any of that shit. So I'm thinking that they're willing to just not do any of that shit for whatever check they think they're going to get. And I'm sure people are going to have some things to say about me from that little analysis, but oh well. <laughs> this is not a, a, a both sides um we need to critique both sides kind of argument. I think I, I, I hope, I hope very much that I have disabused you viewers of the idea that this has ever been a balanced conversation because it's never been a balanced conflict. Regardless of whatever internal issues there are that exist in Russia, and there are some, When it comes to this conflict with Ukraine, it has never been a fair fight. It has never been a balanced conversation. The people entering into negotiations never entered into those negotiations with Russia with balanced or fair intentions. Never. They admitted that. I showed you that they admitted that. So I don't understand how people on the so-called left can come to the conclusion that we need to consider both sides or this is, it's, it's both and, 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 you know, and especially come to the conclusion that Russia is our enemy. It is an enemy that we need to side with the empire against. There is never a reason good enough to side with our oppressors over. And as revolutionaries, I, I don't know how that's not clear, but apparently it's not. Well, maybe because those people are obviously not revolutionaries. I would say they're maybe not even organizers. They're opportunists. That's what I think. They're opportunists. Some of the people are, I think, misguided and deluded and do not have all of the information that they should have. They haven't done their homework. And they refuse to. And I can't do anything about that. All I can do is do what I just did. All I can do is provide my service. Do my part as an organizer to provide my part of this political education. So that you can make an informed decision about where you stand on which side of the barricade you stand when it comes to the empire. Whether you support the pan-European hegemonic project and you're going to side with Ukraine in their plucky little fight against evil Vladimir Putin or are you going to actually apply a solid analysis with the facts that the empire itself provides.
and be clear on where you stand on this issue um, of where you are in this fight uh, between the empire and the rest of us. So that's all I got. <clears throat> Thank y'all so much for hanging out with me for all this additional time. <sighs> it felt so good to get that off my chest because I was pissed for two days. <laughs> With this thing, when I saw this thing and I saw the people who had signed on to this foolishness. So thank you for allowing me and, and hanging out with me and uh, my special guest, Dejamu Baraka, um, venting on this very troubling development in this ongoing conflict uh, <laughs> involving Ukraine. So look, uh, yeah, stay tuned to Luke Mon Nation, Black Power Media for all kinds of good things to come. And until next time, folks, ah, uh, luta continua. The struggle show enough continues, but victoria acerta, victory is certain. Peace. <laughs>